down on my knees again, surrendering, oh, surrendering, oh, Good morning. I'm desperate for you. I surrender. Good morning, good people. Come on in. Sandra, Stacy, Amber, Mama Cookie, Mr. Alfreda, hello, good morning Brandy, good morning to all of my IG family. Baby girl. Emotional triggers, come on. Good morning, baby sister. Miss Bernadette, good morning, honey. Edith Holloway, my classmate. Good morning, Miss Carol. When this song goes off, we'll go in. We're going to talk about triggers this morning. We all have emotional triggers that we allow people to set off. We want to talk about them a little bit this morning.
Man. You know, one of the hardest things to do uh, for many of us is to um, to actually really surrender our lives to him. Uh, it's a it's a challenge because there are so many things that we want to hold on to that we don't want to let go of. And when we surrender to him, there are some things we have to take our hands off of uh, that he will no longer allow us to keep. He says, if you're going to surrender to me, you have to technically throw your hands up and say, Lord, here I am. Take me, do whatever it is you need to do with me and through me. And so it's never easy to surrender everything to him. Every part of you uh, belongs to him and he wants it all. And so uh, good morning to all of you who are uh, in here. Those of you who, who just uh, chimed in. Good morning to you. You know, this is the part of the week that I always get excited about because I love to teach. And I appreciate the fact that you all wait every week with anticipation for uh, what God wants to say through us. And so this morning we want to talk about emotional triggers. And if you have your Bible with you, uh, you could turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll look at uh, verses 26 through 32. And uh, I'm going to highlight some things. I'm not going to um, I'm not going to exegete every single word. But we'll definitely use these uh, scriptures uh, for our context. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. We're talking about emotional triggers. We all have them. Emotional triggers. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. I'm going to read these to you. And I want you to read along with me. Because I know that you don't come to church without your word. I don't ever want you to take anybody's word for anything that's being taught. You need to open your own Bible up. You need to read it for yourself. You need to be exposed to it uh, so that uh, you know the truth. It's the truth that makes us free. And so uh, the word of God says this, verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Some scriptures say wrath. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who is in need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Last two verses. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And so I have just re read to the people of God, the word of God, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 32. And so I want to start out. Uh, first of all, by defining uh, emotional triggers. I always like to lay the foundation by making sure that people know uh, what words mean. We can always assume that people know these things. And so what are emotional triggers? Uh, first, let me pray. I can pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to even exist in the land of the living today. It is in you that we live, move, and have our very existence. We pray, God, that you open our hearts to be receptive to the word, that you would lead and guide us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Have your way, God, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Amen. So let me start out by defining emotional triggers. Emotional triggers are anything, anything, including memories, experiences, or events that spark an intense emotional reaction, regardless of your current mood. Regardless of your current mood, anything including memories, experiences, events that sparks an intense emotional reaction, regardless of your current mood. It is also safe to say 
uh, that a trigger is a reaction to something that happened in your distant past. We all have had experiences. We all have had encounters, things that have happened in the past that sometimes causes us to act in a specific way because we've had these experiences. Um, sometimes people can rub you the wrong way and an old experience will come up and it'll cause a certain reaction out of you. Many people struggle with this. Many people have an underlying issue that is going on that is causing them to respond to people in a specific way who actually did nothing to them. All they really did was just remind them of something that happened in the past. These are called emotional triggers. A trigger takes you back to an experience that is no longer there. A trigger takes you backwards to an experience that is no longer there, but it makes you think that the experience is still happening all over again. Come on, somebody. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Our minds make us believe that we are reliving something that happened in the past when the situation is actually no longer there. Okay, this is called a trigger. If, for example, let me give you an example. If a, if a, a woman or, let, let's just use a woman for example. A woman has been in an abusive relationship and she's no longer in that relationship but someone who actually loves her grabs her in a certain way. Not to be mean, not to be rude, not to be cruel, but actually to show her affection and love. But the way that person grabs her takes her back to an old experience and causes her to unleash on a person who's trying to show love and affection. That is a trigger, you know, and it's causing a reaction or causing her to react to someone who actually did nothing to her but show her love. And so in order to move forward in life, we must deal with triggers. I need you to type this in, triggers. I have triggers. You have them. We all have triggers. Come on, type it in. Stay with me. A trigger takes you back to an experience that is no longer there and makes you think that it is happening all over again. In essence, it makes you bleed uh, on people who did not cut you. Okay? It makes you act a certain type of way. It is a bondage that holds you hostage and gives unlimited access to people who will sometimes pull those triggers at will. And one thing you don't want to do is give the wrong people access to your emotions. You know how it is. You can't, you can't trust everybody with your emotions because some people love to play with emotions. And, and one of the worst things you can do is, is, is to let people know that they have control over a part of you that you don't want them to have access to because some people love to play mind games. You know how it is when someone knows that they, they're getting under your skin and somebody knows that they know how to get to you and you can be having a good day and all of a sudden they want to push a specific button to, to get a certain type of reaction out of you. That's because they know what your triggers are. And so the goal of our message this morning is for us to understand what our triggers are because everybody has them. OK, and once you find out what your triggers are and what sets you off and what puts you in a bad mood and, and, and what throws your whole day off and sometimes your whole life off that causes you to cuss folk out, that causes you to lose your mind. OK, it's your responsibility at that point. Once you admit that you have triggers to deactivate them. If you're ever going to win, if you're ever going to experience elevation, if you're ever going to grow, you must deactivate your triggers. And once you deactivate those triggers, you'll know because some of those same folk will come back trying to push those same buttons. And if they don't get no reaction, guess what? You just won. You just won.
Man, <clears throat> you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are certain people in all of our lives who know exactly what to do to throw your whole day off. They know exactly what to say. I did a post on Facebook and I was just joking. Uh, I've, I've been having week, uh, having fun all week with the women. And one post I told women, one thing you don't need to do is say your mammy to your man. That's, that's one of the worst things that you can do. And come on, women, let's get honest just for a moment. A woman will tell a man when he makes her feel a certain type of way, your mammy to, uh, get under his skin. It's a trigger. Come on, somebody. Somebody say amen. It's a trigger. If you can't get him no other way, just to simply say two words, yo, mammy is going to, come on, trigger a response out of him because you know, guess what? It's a trigger because you don't talk about nobody's mama. And so watch this. If he deactivates that trigger next time she says it, and doesn't get a response, guess what she's going to do? She's going to move on to something else. And I need you to understand this morning that the enemy knows that you have triggers. He knows you have triggers. And surrounds you with people who knows what your triggers are. Why? Because if I could get you to pull that trigger and to respond in a specific way, then I can actually cut your life short I can rob you of your future, rob somebody else of their future, and rob you of what God has in store for you, if I can get you to pull your trigger. And so, you must, I said you must, deactivate your trigger. Because if you deactivate those triggers, you have less arguments the things that used to upset you will no longer bother you. The people who irk you the most won't irk you as much. Why? Because now you're in a space to where you expect people to try to set you off and you're already preparing for it. You're already preparing for it. If you know it's coming, then it stands to reason at some point you got to prepare for it. Because if somebody wants to get under your skin and somebody wants to get to you and set you off, they're going to, you know, they're going to aim for what they know works. Let's move on. Emotional triggers are all around us. They're always lurking at every corner, attempting to what? Catch us off guard. People are destroyed daily simply because certain emotions creep up on them and take them on a wild roller coaster ride. And guess what? When the roller coaster stops, everybody's life has been altered. Why? Because people cannot handle their own emotions. We need to get a grip on these emotions. We've had so much stuff to happen in our city and all over the world because people cannot tame their emotions. We want to walk around in this world and act like we're okay when we have underlying issues that we refuse to deal with. Triggers. They're triggers. Emotional triggers. Watch this. Listen to me. Emotional triggers usually reveal pain points or painful points in our lives that we didn't know existed. And so when a person has a trigger, it really reveals that they have pain in their life. I'm just keeping it real with y'all. If you, if you can't listen to a, a real one, then I don't know what to tell you. When a person has triggers, that, what, what that trigger really is, it is a painful place in their life that they have not dealt with. And because either you're, you're afraid to face it, you're afraid to deal with it, or you become comfortable, or you just don't acknowledge that it's there. But either way it goes, you're in pain, and when someone rubs you the wrong way, it reminds you of the pain that you're in. And when you feel pain, it pulls the trigger, and it causes you to react in a specific way. Triggers. Triggers. Emotional triggers. 
Triggers are painful. <laughs> Triggers are painful experiences that you have not overcome. They're painful experiences that, and, and you know what? One of the hardest things to deal with is painful experiences. A lot of people try to bury their past experiences and try to act like they're not there. And just because they have buried the experience, they believe that the experience no longer exists. This is what they try to make themselves believe. But what's really going on is that the, the old experience is very well alive and it's controlling what's going on in your life currently. Just because it's hidden doesn't mean it's not there. It's still working. Have you ever asked yourself the question, man, I wonder why they act like this. I wonder why. I wonder what, why did they do that? Like, why do they respond that way when these things happen? I didn't, like, what happened? It's because they buried something that they thought was dead. And guess what? It's still alive. It's, a, it's an emotional trigger and it comes from painful experiences. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples of emotional triggers. Everybody know who Joseph is in the Bible. Joseph is the is the man who brothers dug, uh, put him in in the ditch. Y'all go back and read the story in Genesis. Uh, his brothers, they were they were actually dealing with feelings of rejection from their father. Because remember, if you go back and you read the story in Genesis 37, 34 30, uh, through 37, all the way to chapter 40, I think, uh, what you will see is that these brothers were dealing with feelings of rejection because they felt like their father treated Joseph better. Okay? And so they feel rejected by their father because he made a multicolored tunic for Joseph that he never made for them. So we're dealing with feelings of rejection right here and abandonment from their father. That had absolutely nothing to do with Joseph. He's not responsible for the affection that his father was showing him, okay? So he's not the issue here. The issue is between the brothers and how they felt about their dad. They thought that he treated Joseph better than them, okay? Stick with me. Every night they slept with these feelings and guess what happened with the feelings? The feelings just constantly got worse. Anytime you feel a certain way, anger, bitterness, rejection, and you, and you sleep with these emotions every single night, the emotions become more intense. They get stronger, even to the point that they become uncontrollable. Okay, because if you don't deal with how you feel and you constantly sleep on these emotions every single day, at some point, the emotions overtake you. At some point, the emotions overtake you and you end up doing things that you said or thought you would never do. It's because you have not gotten a handle on your emotions. Okay. So every night they slept with these feelings. All of these brothers went to bed. They were having side conversations about, man, look at how he treating him. Man, daddy ain't right. Man, he's showing favoritism. And so they're feeling rejected. Some of you feel the same way about your siblings. You feel like your mama treated them better. You feel like your daddy treated them better. You feel like that side of the family treats them better. You feel like you're the black sheep in the family. You feel like nobody treats you like they treat them. And it causes you to develop uh, feelings or your yeah, feelings of rejection. And now every time you see somebody else being accepted, it makes you feel some type of way uh, toward those people because you are dealing with feelings of rejection in your own heart. Nothing is wrong with the people. It's you. It's you not dealing with your own emotions. And guess what? Your emotions begin to overtake and control you. Okay. So eventually they saw Joseph. Remember, this is their brother. This is their blood. Uh, they saw him by himself and the sight of him caused them to pull the trigger and act on their own emotions. They got him by himself. They said, oh, here he come. Here come daddy's favorite. OK, this is the type of stuff that they're saying to Joseph. Remember, he's done nothing to them when he showed up 
the very sight of him pulled that trigger. You know what they did to their brother? They plotted. They put that man in a ditch. They actually wanted to kill him, but an older brother said, no, let's not kill our brother. Let's just put him in. Let's just put him in the cistern. Let's just put him in the ditch and let him die of thirst. They wanted to actually take their brother out for a reason that had nothing to do with him because they were dealing with feelings of rejection. The real issue wasn't Joseph. The real issue was between them and their father. They had daddy issues. They had daddy issues. Now, listen to me. Listen to me very closely. Rejected people treat accepted people with contempt. I want you to write it down because I want you to remember this. And the reason I want you to remember this is because once you start hanging out or being around people who are dealing with rejection, then you, it causes you to always move with caution. OK, rejected people treat accepted people with contempt. That means they have an issue with everybody always been accepted. Why? Because I've always been rejected. Okay? So when you are in celebration mode and everybody is celebrating you, this is where you get people who are always side-eyeing the ones being celebrated. And the reason they are side-eyeing your celebration is because they haven't dealt with their feelings of rejection. OK, so they'll never be able to celebrate you. They'll always be side eyeing your new business adventure. They'll always be side eyeing the fact that people are saying, man, did you see their new house? Did you see their new car? They'll always be side eyeing you because they have not dealt with their own emotions. The problem is not you. The problem is what they refuse to deal with. <laughs> you don't have to say amen because you know I'm telling the truth. And so you got the man, listen, y'all got to start paying attention. You got to start paying attention. Listen, when it's time to celebrate and when it's time to share good news, you share your good news with the people who you want to share it with, but you better pay attention to their reaction. Okay. You don't. Listen, it's written all over your face. You don't have to say a word. If you are sharing good news and they're not celebrating with you, it's because they haven't dealt with some emotions that they have going on inside of them. I'm just keeping it real. That's all. And so rejected people treat accepted people with contempt. When everybody is calling your name, you know, they're wondering why they ain't calling them. When everybody's, when your name is ringing and people talking about your success, you got haters they mad that it's not them. And once they deal with their own emotions, because let me tell you something about jealousy. Jealousy will make a person kill another individual. Jealousy will make a man kill his own brother or sister. Jealousy calls cousins to plot on cousins. Jealousy will cause a person to have no regard for the life of the person that they're jealous of. Jealousy when it takes over an individual, they will go to any extent to have what another person has or to take what another person has accomplished. You can't trust a jealous person. I don't care. Listen, I don't care if it's your BFF. I don't care if it's your sibling. I don't care who it is. If they have a jealous spirit, you cannot trust them. You can't trust them. Second, let me give you the second, second biblical example. Okay. Cause I want to keep it biblical. All right. We have David and Saul. Remember David was the shepherd boy. Saul was the king of Israel. Y'all with me? Okay. Saul had triggers to develop due to his lack of success in defeating Goliath. Okay. So, so listen to me. Let me make it real plain and simple to you. Saul, who was in position, he was the head brother in charge. All right. But just because he was in charge did not mean that he had the power to overcome and defeat everything. That was somebody who was a little bit more courageous than he was. He had the position, but he did not have the power. Shepherd boy David comes up. 
let me let me stick to my notes here. Let me stick to my notes because I'm about to go off on a tantrum here. All right. Saul, he was highly he was a highly respected leader, a highly respected leader until a little boy did something that he could not do. OK, David defeated the giant that we know as Goliath. No other leader was able to defeat Goliath. Everybody else was afraid of him. Everybody else was intimidated by Goliath. David shows up and you know what David did? He took on the challenge. He took on the challenge. David was celebrated and Saul's triggers was pulled because guess what? Because a little boy did something that a king couldn't do. Now, I need you to hear me on this right here. When you start doing things that others can't do or have not succeeded in yet, you got to watch out because just like a Saul did, a trigger was pulled. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 18 and 9, and from that time, Saul kept a close eye on David. Why was he watching David? Because he knew that if David killed Goliath, and now that the people are singing his praises and calling his name, I need to watch out for him because when they start calling his name, it's, it's, it started making Saul feel inferior to a little boy. <laughs> so watch this. Listen to me. You know what his trigger was? His insecurity. Somebody type in insecure. Insecure. When a person is insecure, they are always threatened by those who are secure. Lord have mercy. Triggers reveal your real pain. Now, I'm going to take you to the Bible. I'm getting ready to take you to the scriptures. And we're getting ready to define some terms. And I need you to stick with me because this is important. What does the Bible say about triggers? I want you to look at Ephesians 4.26. Ephesians 4.26. This is what it says. I'm just going to read this verse. It says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. OK, one thing you don't want to do is give an, a, the devil an opportunity to rob you of what God promised you to set you back, to hold you hostage and to keep you in bondage. And so one, this the Bible is saying that this is what the verse is saying. Stop internalizing your issue by sleeping with it every night. Stop internalizing your issue by sleeping with it every night. At some point, you have to find a way to release this stuff. Type in release, release, okay? At some point, you gotta stop going to bed with all this negativity in your heart and on your mind and you have to find a way to get it up off you. Get it up off you. Because the longer you sleep with the problem, the stronger the problem becomes. Stop sleeping with the issue. Woo! Because when you sleep with the issue, you are giving the devil an opportunity. An opportunity to rob you of your peace. An opportunity to have folk laughing at you because you ain't over the issue yet. Another opportunity for to destroy you and rob you of your destiny. Stop sleeping with your issue. Stop trying to internalize it. Saying to yourself, I got this. No, baby, you ain't got it. It got you. All right. And so you have to find a way to get it out of your heart. And out on the table so you can deal with it. You have to release it. I know in our community, we don't believe in this, in this, but even if you have to get counseling, whatever you have to do to experience freedom, whatever you have to do 
to get back to that place of peacefulness. Whatever you have to do to be free in your heart, to be free in your mind, to be able to sleep at night without tossing and turning, whatever you have to do to get this stuff off of you, talk to somebody and stop going through this junk by yourself. That's why the scripture says you can be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And I'm going to define these terms for you in a minute. Don't don't leave because you're going to miss out on the good part. OK, so get you some counseling for the pain that you cannot overcome. Because remember, when people have triggers, it's simply pain that they have not overcome yet. So stop going to bed in pain. Stop sleeping every night thinking that it's going to subside by itself. No, sometimes you got to be proactive in getting free. You got to be proactive. You got to be intentional. The stuff that's been bothering you and weighing on you, you got to be intentional. And you got to be, um, you got to definitely be proactive in getting this stuff out of your life. And let me tell you this, admit that the pain is there. Some people aren't willing to admit that they have pain in their life. If you don't admit it, then you'll never come up with a resolution for what's going on. So admit that I'm in pain. I'm dealing with, with this pain. Like, you got to admit it. It must come out of your mouth. You must be honest about where you are. You got to let it go. You have to trust God with the process. And usually when you let something go, the initial letting go of it is painful. So sometimes it seems like it's getting worse and sometimes it does get worse before it gets better. But at all costs, get it up off you. What else does the scripture say? I want you to look at Ephesians 4.31. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you along with all malice. Now I'm going to define every term I just said. Bitterness, it says, get it all away from you. What is bitterness? Bitterness is a feeling of pain or distress. So when a person is bitter, you know what it is pain. If you still talking about your baby daddy and slandering him because he ain't taking care of his kids, if you still on that right there, guess what? Pain. That's all it is. Some part of the relationship it, or the past relationship is, is still causing you present pain. That's all it is. That's why you keep talking about it. That's why you still bitter. People who are always bashing other people, you bitter. And the reason you bitter is because you're in pain. And so anytime you encounter a bitter person, it's important that you remember and that you acknowledge that that person is in pain. And people who are in pain like to inflict pain on others. All right. I need you to understand that. So anytime you are dealing with a bitter person, I need you to step back from the picture and just count the 10 backwards. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I need you to think for a moment before you react to the individual. I need you to understand that person is in pain that they, they, they have pain that they refuse to deal with. So you don't need to react to individuals like that. Because bitterness equals pain or distress. And the, and the scripture says, let it go. Next, it says wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is vengeance or punishment as a consequence of anger. That means that this person who is angry releases their wrath on other individuals because they haven't dealt with their own stuff. It's called vengeance or it's called punishment as a consequence of anger. This is why the scripture encourages us don't even hang out with angry people because they're always going about trying to punish other individuals. You got a, a whole lot of grown little boys who terrorize the city, shoot people, hurt people, destroying families because they are wrathful, which means that they're in pain. 
The reason, the reason it's so easy to take a life because another person feels like they want others to feel the pain that they feel. It's called wrath, people. Next, it says anger. What is anger? Anger, so we, we dealt with bitterness, which is a, a feeling of pain or distress. We're dealing, we talked about wrath, which is vengeance or punishment as a consequence of your own anger. Anger itself is a strong feeling of displeasure and belligerence aroused by a wrong. It means that somebody did you wrong, okay, and you have not overcome what they've done to you. And so you walk around angry at the world. And if you are an angry person, it's because the person that hurt you still has control of what they've done to you. You don't. It doesn't matter what you've been through. You still don't have to walk around in this world as an angry individual. There are people in the world who's been through way more than what you've been through. And guess what? They trust God with the process. They overcame it. And now they are enjoying and living their best life. You can live your best life despite what you've been through. And so anger is a strong feeling of displeasure and belligerence aroused by a wrong. Next, we have the word clamor, C-L-A-M-O-U-R. If you read in your Bible, you see this word. This word is a vehement expression of collective feelings or outrage, okay? The word vehement is a simple word that means strong. It means strong and violent, okay? So a clamorous person is a violent person who is expressing their emotions in outrage. Some people are just outraged. They're angry. They, their emotions are out of control. Okay. I got two more words. Slander. I want everybody to type that word in. Slander. What is slander? Slander. The Bible is telling us in Ephesians 4.31 to put all this stuff away from us. Put all of it away from us. What is slander? Slander is defamation. Defamation by oral utterance. Okay? When you are dealing with a slanderous individual, you are dealing with an individual who's slick with their tongue. You are dealing with the person who assassinate people daily by the things they say about them. Okay. It, 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 when you're dealing with a slanderous individual, a slanderous individual will make up a lie. They will say whatever is necessary to throw some shade on the person that you really are. And some of you are friends with slanderous individuals and some of you might be slanderers. OK, but if you are a friend with a slanderous individual, you are friends with somebody who is assassinating the character of other people for no reason at all. And I need you to understand that this word was written to church people. And so what I'm saying is that in order for Paul to write this letter to the uh, church in Ephesus, to believers, it had to be going on with religious individuals, people who go to church. And let me just go ahead and put this out here. Some of the most slanderous people in the world are people who go to church. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. It's just the honest truth. That's why Paul had to write this letter to the church, because it's church people who be slandering folk. This wasn't written to unbelievers. This was written to believers, people who say they love the Lord, people who go to church, people who shout, people who be holy and praise dancing all in the aisles, flipping and shouting over the pews, people in the choir, pastors, leaders, deacons, parishioners. The most slanderous people there is. Defamation by oral utterance. You praising God with one tongue and slandering people with the other one. People like that give snake vibes. Because you got a forked tongue and snakes have forked tongues. 
and a, a, and a person with a fart tongue would say hi to you. Hey, how you doing, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so? And then go over here to dinner with somebody else and chop you up at the table. They ain't even got to eat the food they ordered. Why? Because they're serving you up. Defamation by oral utterance. And then it says malice. We know that a malice person is a malicious person. They do things with evil intent. They do things with evil intent. And all of these things are signs that a person have not dealt with their own pain. That's all it is. And so they got triggers and you have triggers. And so in order for you to not be affected by somebody else's triggers, it stands to reason that you must deal with yours because a trigger can cause another trigger to be unleashed. You don't want to be that individual. And so my reason for this message this morning is to simply remind you to deal with your triggers. Because the longer your triggers are untapped and untouched and you don't deal with them, the more other people are going to be controlling you. Every time they say something to you, trigger. Every time they do something, trigger. Every time somebody else win and you ain't won yet, trigger. Every time somebody else purchases a, a, have a praise report or purchase a new house, you angry, you jealous, you mad, trigger. Deal with these underlying issues so you can be free. Free to live the life that God promised you. Because I'm not trying to live somebody else's life. And neither should you be trying to walk in somebody else's shoes and live somebody else's life. Because there is a life that God intends for you to live. And if you stop trying to be like other people and, scro and, and strolling through social media, trying to mimic the life that somebody else ain't even really truly living, then you can actually live the life that God promised you and be successful at it. Because when you start walking in your own anointing and you start living the life that God promised you, it comes with benefits. But when you start trying to live somebody else's life, the, the life that they're showing you on social media that has the people that are showing it ain't even really living like that. When you start trying to mimic that, you start mimicking their flaws. You start trying to be something that somebody else ain't even accomplished. Live your life and live it to the fullest. And get rid of those triggers. Deal with them. Because your triggers will rob you, your children, and your grandchildren of the future that God promised you. Because if you're affected by your triggers, then the people who are connected to you are affected as well. Somebody said, well, how can I deal with my triggers? First of all, you can deal with your triggers by coming to God. By coming to God and saying, Lord, here I am. I got these triggers. I got these issues going on and they're going on inside of me. Lord, I was hurt 10 years ago and I still haven't overcome that yet. And so now if I see anybody who look like or act like the individual that hurt me, then I respond like that person is still here. Lord, help me to deal with these triggers. Help me to deal with my mama issues. Help me to deal with my daddy issues. You want to know why? Because I don't want to pass this stuff on to my children and my children pass it on to my grandchildren all the way to the third and fourth generation. I want to deal with my issues. I want to deal with my shortcomings. I want to come to you, Lord, and I want you to probe my life and my heart and anything that is not like you. I want you to pull it out of me. I want you to put me back on the potter's wheel. I want you to speak Spin that thing and take that unfinished, that mal that malice, that, that bitterness, that anger. I want you to take all of these things out of me, the sin that so easily beset all of us. Lord, I need you to just deal with me. That's all I'm saying. Just deal with me. Deal with my mess. Help me to become a better person. I want to be a better Ron King than I was last year. And so in order for me to become that, Lord, I got to come to you. I can't come arrogant and prideful like my life is really together. No, all of us are falling apart and we need to come to God and surrender it to him. That's all he wants. And I know some of you are saying, man, I got to get myself together. Listen, if you could get yourself together, you would have done it a long time ago. 
The problem is that we cannot get it together on our own. And I know you've done things in your past and I know you got things going on right now. But listen, one thing about my God is that he will take you how you are, but he won't leave you how you came. You don't have to fix yourself up to come to God. But if you come to him, he'll fix you up. He'll fix you up. And, and listen, once you're in this relationship with him, you will begin to experience life on a different level. My life has never been the same ever since I've come into a relationship with God. It has not been perfect. I have not crossed every T, dotted every I. I have not done everything the way I'm supposed to do it. But I promise you that ever since my relationship has been solid with him, my life has never been the same. And if you think my life is still the same way it used to be, you must not have known who I was. <laughs> because if you had known me, Lord have mercy, you would know that the new Ron King ain't the same Ron King. Because I let a lot of folks slide with stuff. I, man, that's a whole nother something. All I'm saying is come to God. Come to him the way you are. Be honest about your triggers. Be honest that you still hurt because daddy wasn't there. Not for you. He was there for the other ones. Be honest. I know a lot of little young men who are running around ter terrorizing the city. And really, all they want is their daddy. That's all they want. The the only person that can stop a lot of these young men from doing what they're doing in our city is God and their dads. If their dad will come to them, sit down with them and fix the relationship, a lot of them boys are easily put down their guns, be with their dads. That's all they want. All they want is their dad to come up, put his arm around his neck. Come on, son. Come on, let's go fishing. Come on, let's go do this. Come on, let's go spend some time. I can remember when I was about 16, 17 years old, working at the Red Food Store. Um, I was missing my dad, you know, because he wasn't really there. He's always been in my life, but not always a part of it. And one time I was missing my dad. I had a job, had a little money. I went and got my a couple of my brothers and we went and found our dad. And you know what I did? I paid for a little hotel on Broad Street with my work money just to spend some time with my dad. And so I can identify with a lot of these young men who just want, dad, I just want to spend some time with you. I want you to acknowledge me. And it's just something about a man who says son to his son. When you call him son, it just does something to a young man's heart to hear that from his own dad. You know, so I don't know who's watching this, but if you're a father and you ain't seen your son in a while, man, go put your arms around him and just tell him you love him. Try to talk some sense into him. Apologize for the times you were not there. You know, try to rectify, fix the situation because a lot of these young boys are reachable. They're, they're reachable. But guess who got the key? To, uh, to their hearts. Their fathers do. The father, mothers, you've done everything that you can. I know you have. You, you worn yourself out. You cried yourself crazy trying to reach your sons. I understand that. But you don't have the key to his heart. You don't have the key. His father has the key to his heart. One of the worst things that can happen to a boy is for his father to be alive. And his father not be there. And the thing about a lot of these boys, they'll let their daddy fix it. If you just show up. Just show up and fix it, man. Just fix it. Your 15 year old shouldn't be walking around in the city shooting folks. Your 14 year old shouldn't be all over the city. 11, 12 o'clock at night. And I ain't trying to get in nobody's business. They're your children. You know, I, I'm just saying it's part of the problem. I can't tell nobody how to raise their, ch their children. 
We got a lot of great programs and a lot of great mentors in this city. Ain't no reason in the world that any young man should go without a, a mentor, a male figure in his life in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We got all these different programs. And if you don't want to put your kid in a program, just link them up with a man that you know can reach him. It ain't even got to be a program. It can be an individual. I'm done for the day. It's just the truth. And so let me say this. If you don't know Christ as, as your Lord and Savior today, I don't see how I don't see how you can go without him. I don't see how you can live every single day without a relationship with your maker. And if you're still breathing, obviously, if you can hear me, you're alive. That means that you still have an opportunity to go to God. You, you, it don't have to be in a church setting. A lot of people get it twisted. It's a lot of saved people who don't visit buildings. It's a lot of saved people who know God for real. And they actually do the work. They're just not a part of a congregation. All I'm saying is no matter where you are, what you're doing, stop right now. And ask him to come into your heart. Say, Lord, I need you to come into my heart. I need you to save me from me. I need you to save me from Satan. I need you to save me from sin. I need you to save me from all of that. Why? Because when I die, I want to make sure that I'm standing before you and I'm, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I don't want, listen, stop playing with that right there. Don't play with that. And you need to be saved also. Uh, because I believe that saved parents leave a legacy for their kids. You being saved and you following God, if you can't leave an inheritance, a financial inheritance to your children, at least you can leave salvation behind. My father was saved. My mama was saved. They loved the Lord. I ain't saying you got to be a holy roller. All I'm saying is make sure that your relationship with God is intact. Because guess what? We got a godless generation of people. Godless. Don't care nothing about God. We'll blow your brains out at the drop of a dime and go do the time and not even think about it. And so when you start living in a day like this, you better get your life together. You better get it right with God. Because folk going to see him sooner than they think. You got to be ready. You got to be ready. And so if you don't know him, the scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, come into my life. Be sincere about it. Save me. And he does it instantly. Okay. It doesn't mean that everything in your life changes because some stuff is a process. Okay. God is processing you, but the process starts with you asking him to come into your heart. Lord, change my heart because the heart that I have, I, I don't like it. The heart that I have is, is bitter. It'll hurt some folk. The heart that I have, Lord, I know it ain't right. I want the heart of God. Give me your heart, God. So even when I'm wrong, that I'm tender enough to ask for forgiveness and apologize to others. We live in, live in a society where people don't even apologize no more. They do stuff to you and act like it ain't nothing. Won't even say I'm sorry. Pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. But when you have a tender heart, when you hurt somebody, you feel a type of way about it. You, you can't sleep at night until you go back and apologize or at least try to rectify the situation. Create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, Lord. So what I want to do, I want to pray for you before we get out of here. Father, we thank you for every person who's still logged in, any person who's visited our uh, live uh, broadcast father we pray right now that you would touch us all we all have triggers that need to be deactivated god and i pray right now that you begin to deactivate them that anger that bitterness that outrage that uh screaming that fighting that fussing that that jealousy all of those things lord we pray that you would deactivate those things right now even as we are praying god Create within all of us that clean heart and renew a right spirit within us, Lord. Help us to become the people that you've called us to be. You've given us all potential, Lord, and help us to live up to our best potential. Let us live our best life. Let us live the best version of ourselves that we can. We pray for forgiveness, Lord, because we know that we've all sinned and come short of your glory. Your word says if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray, Lord, that you would just open up your window of heaven and pour us out blessings so we don't have enough room to receive them. Let our cups overflow that we may be a blessing to those around us, Lord. We pray that you would help us to be more kind. Help us to exercise the fruit of the spirit, Lord. Help us to show love. Help us to be peaceful people, Lord. And the Bible says... 
as much as it depends on us, let us be at peace with all men. And so, God, we just want to be uh, better for you, better for our kids, better for our grandkids, better for our families, and better for this world that we are living in, God. Help us because we cannot do it without you. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, apart from you, we can do nothing. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to give his life as a ransom for many. The uh, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so we thank you for salvation. We thank you, Lord, for changing us. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first. Help us, Lord. Today is the beginning of a new journey for us all. We're going to be aware of our triggers. And as we become more aware of them, we will begin to deactivate them. And so when people push our buttons, those buttons will no longer give the response that it used to give. We thank you for the victory. We thank you for the power. We thank you for the dominion. We thank you, Lord, that we are overcomers. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, people. So there it is. Uh, we thank you uh, for coming in here. We thank you uh, for uh, just being proactive in the changes that are taking place in your own life. Um, just continue to grow. Ask God to keep growing you. Continue to become more wise daily. Read. Get some understanding. Ask God to give you wisdom. Wisdom is simply knowing what to do next. That's all wisdom is. Ask God to lead you, guide you down the right path. Lord, I can't do this without you. You know, especially you got kids. I see some amazing fathers on here. Uh, you, you, you know, you do it for, for the family. Yeah, you do it for you, but you know what you're raising. You're raising kids uh, who are going to break generational curses. You're raising doctors and lawyers and uh, financial advisors. You're raising up people who are going to run this world in the future. And uh, what you do now is going to contribute uh, to uh, what they're going to be doing later. And so I love love you all. Uh, and I thank God for every opportunity that he gives me to speak life and speak encouragement into the lives of those of you who are faithful listeners on here. Uh, people have been asking, when are we going back into a church? Um, I can't give you a specific date, but, you know, I'm open to it uh, if God makes it happen. Uh, he opened the door for us to go back in. We will go back in, uh, you know, but until then, I'm going to continue to teach online and be faithful at this right here because we are still reaching people. Lives are still changing. Uh, even uh, with the silly stuff that I put on Facebook, and I know the women know that uh, I cut up a lot. And I do it all in fun because we have so much hurt and pain going on in the city uh, that you got to do something to take people's mind off of it. And so sometimes I will do some posts that will make people laugh. And it's it be real stuff, but it still be funny at the same time. And so uh, it's never an attack on women or an attack on men or anything like that. But I'm just standing in the gap for men right now because uh, in the past, so many pastors have um, have been for the women that we've forgotten about the men. And so it's my responsibility uh, to come in here and let the men know that there is somebody standing with the men and it is me, Ron King. So, uh, but anyway, I love you all. Uh, if you want to so give, you have every opportunity to do that. You can cash out Inner Peace Church. You can go to our website, which is www.innerpeacechurch.org or you can text give to 423-301-5545. Tab will drop the information uh, in the comments and you can go from there. Uh, we appreciate you all. We love you. Uh, if you are sick, just remember that God is still a healer. If you are discouraged, it is God who gives you joy unspeakable. If you're broke, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, and, and if you think you've been cursed, guess what? God is getting ready to bless you. Everything that was designed to tear your life apart, God is getting ready to turn it around and make it work for your good and in your favor. And so I love you all. I am Ron King, uh, the one and only. I'll talk to you all later. May God keep you and may he bless you. Bye.